The Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs acknowledges that we are gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains, and we pay respect to the Blackfoot people past, present, and future, while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. We offer respect to the Métis and all who have lived on this land and made Lethbridge their home. So uh, I just want everybody to know that I'm not officially here. Um, we're allowed to work from home two days out of the week now. It's a federal government employee. And I worked at home this morning, so I was driving on my way to work, which is in that direction. I live on the west side. And I thought I'd just stop in here and see if people wanted a presentation or not. And it, it looks like there's about 70 people that are looking for a presentation, so here I am to deliver it. So I wanted to, uh, Christy asked me to give the presentation and I, there's a lot of different things I could talk about but I, I thought I'd talk about uh, uh, cows and whether they're the scourge of the planet or not. We are continuously being bombarded about how uh, much cattle are uh, damaging the environment through the greenhouse gases, particularly the methane they produce and the negative impacts that they have on water quality and how they're competing with humans for food that uh, people could eat rather than cows eat. Uh, so there's been a lot of information like that that's been coming out. Some of it has some merit. A lot of it doesn't have that much merit. And a lot of our research program has actually been trying to take like a scientific approach to address some of those points. Some of it we can do through direct measurements by using instruments to measure greenhouse gases. Some of it we can only do through modeling exercises because there's a lot of assumptions we have to make in the calculations. So I thought I'd just give some perspective then today about where cows fit in and, and you know some of the benefits and some of the challenges they pose on the environment. So I think most people are finding it difficult to deny that climate change is not taking place as we continue to move forward. In time, we see these increasing levels of fire. So we know we lost another third of a town in the form of Jasper burning down this year. Uh, 2023 set the record in terms of the fires that took place uh, in Canada at that time. We see an increasing evidence of these uh, dramatic climate events taking place. And as we move forward and the temperature continues to rise, uh, you know, we were trying to restrict it to one and a half degree increase. It looks like we've already achieved that. Uh, so we're going to definitely be past that by 2050 for sure. And as we get warmer and warmer, these events are going to get more and more severe as time goes on. Uh, if you look at the, this is some predicted modeling of how kind of fires in North America you can have and really the types of fires we had in Canada in 2023 was more like what it would be with a two and a half degrees uh, increase in global temperature than with one and a half. So in some ways we're already achieving these uh, events that were predicted to occur 20 or 30 years in the future. And it doesn't matter where the carbon dioxide comes from, whether it's respired by us or respired by cattle or if it's uh, from fossil fuel burning or the forest fires, all that carbon dioxide has the same global warming potential or impact on climate change. Uh, and when we look at the wildfire, you know, this is something that's a bit alarming with regard to climate change, is that we're seeing more and more of these natural events that are even contributing more carbon to the uh, processes that lead to climate change and the warming that we're seeing. So the, the fires that we had produced about 647 megatons of CO2. Uh, that's about three times the annual carbon footprint of Canada and about 10 times about what we produce from agriculture. So that was just in last year's forest fires. They haven't come up. It's going to be a bit less because the fires weren't as broad this year as it was last year. Uh, those figures are still being developed as to what that represents. And we're seeing increasingly now where there's a number of lawsuits that are being developed as well where uh, they're suing governments for not taking action against climate change. And that starts to hit your pocketbook and uh, still money is what gets people's attention more than anything when it co starts costing you more. And we're seeing that same uh, sort of impact as well that we're experiencing uh, on our insurance prices as we continue to have these disasters. It was a bit surprising with the hailstorm that just hit Calgary uh, that that was larger than the one that we heard a couple of years back, which we thought was the largest one. So as those uh, events continue to occur, our insurance is going to get more and more expensive. But if we look across in terms of agriculture and where in Canada where the energy is 
is actually utilized. About 5.6% uh, or so comes from the agricultural sector. By far the largest is energy consumption, so the burning of fossil fuels. That's why we're having climate change. If we'd have left all those uh, petroleum products in the ground and we hadn't combusted them to produce CO2, we wouldn't be talking about climate change at all. Um, when we look at the beef cattle sector, it accounts for about 2.4% of what's coming out of agriculture. When we look at it in terms of a percentage of global emissions, it's about 0.04% of global emissions is, represents the Canadian beef industry. So it's really a drop in the lake. Um, everybody can make the argument that I'm a drop in the lake, so why should I bother doing anything? Uh, and, and that will, of course, lead to inaction if everybody has that attitude. Um, but when it comes to the Canadian beef industry, actually, they're very pro proactive. The Beef Cattle Research Council has many of the uh, major research programs that are dealing with environmental aspects uh, of beef cattle production. They're more proactive than many other uh, organizations, beef cattle organizations in other areas of the world. <laughs> When we look at the distribution of where those emissions come from, about 80% comes from the cow-calf herd, about 20% from the feedlots. So usually feedlots are getting beat up pretty bad because they represent an intensive, uh, often people use the term factory farming type of approach to uh, meat production. But actually in the case of our production system, feedlots are beneficial from the fact that they lower our greenhouse gas emissions as opposed to if we produced everything out on pasture. And part of that's related to the fact that the amount of methane that's produced per unit of forage that's digested when the animal is out grazing is higher than what it is when grain is part of the diet, so we end up with lower methane emissions. Also, uh, our feedlot system dramatically reduces the length of time that it takes to get an animal to the weight for suitable for slaughter, and of course, there's no lo better way to lower the emissions of livestock than to process them into meat because they don't produce emissions after that point. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of diversity then in, in terms of, of, of uh, how much emissions, and of course beef always gets tagged as, as being the larger emitter per kilogram of protein produced, and there is some merit in that, but it has to be then taken in the perspective of the types of feed that we're providing to the cattle versus if we're talking poultry or swine, which are being fed much higher quality diets uh, with more digestible uh, nutrients and nutrients that are actually more suitable for, for food for humans as well. And it's really all related to feed conversion efficiency. So when you want to estimate feed conversion, the higher the quality of diet that you provide to the animal, the less effort it has to take then in terms of the energy and effort that it takes to digest that feed. And as a result then that animal will have more energy that will be directed towards growth and less that will be directed towards maintenance. Whereas when we're talking cattle, because they're eating lower quality feeds, it takes more effort, more complicated enzymes to break that feed down, uh, longer periods period of time for that digestion to take place as well. And so the amount of gain that you get per unit of feed is lower. Uh, but that's at the uh, benefit of that you're using lower quality feeds that are really not suitable in many instances for consumption by humans. <coughs> So as I said, the Canadian industry has been quite proactive in terms of taking steps to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We did a study back in 2016 where we compared changes in emissions, the carbon footprint of beef production over a 30 year period. Uh, going from 1981 to 2011. And over that period of time, we estimated that the emissions had been reduced by about 15% uh, within the beef industry. And that's in line with other nations that have similar beef production practices like ours, such as in Australia and in the United States. So we're all documented a similar reduction because of the technologies and changes in genetics and other factors that we've run to bear to improve the efficiency of production. So basically then, you know, to produce the same quantity of beef in Canada in 2011 versus 1981, uh, we can do that with 27% fewer cattle are uh, required for that, which then leads to 29% or so less in the breeding herd. If you can produce that same amount of meat uh, with fewer animals, you don't need as many uh, breeding herds in order to produce those animals. Uh, that then resulted in a reduction of about 24% less land that was required to produce it. And where did that positive change come from? Well, some of it's related to reproductive efficiency. Our calving rates are the highest uh, amongst anywhere in the world. 
we also have increases in, in our carcass weights across the board and a lot of that has uh, been responsible for the majority of those improvements that we see. So we're slaughtering animals at the same age that are far larger than they were before. And, and when you look at any animal, including ourselves, uh, we have a certain amount, once we get mature, we don't put as much energy into growth other than depositing fat in some of us. But uh, in, in this case, you've got a certain amount of energy that's diverted towards growth, a certain amount that's diverted to maintenance. If you have a larger carcass, then the percentage that's going to maintenance is less than what went into growth, and as a result, you also have improvements in efficiency. <laughs> And also it involves taking this a, a, a systems perspective as well. We've had large improvements in our forages and, and, and the feeds that we're producing to feed these animals. So if we increase yields, you also need less land to produce the same amount of feed. So that represents another benefit. Particularly in corn, which yields continue to continuously increase. Uh, they've pretty well exponentially increased since the uh, Second World War and they continue to go up and really we don't know how far we can continue to improve those yields. We have some restrictions here because we're kind of on the northern limit of the corn belt, but in Iowa, central U.S., uh, those yields just continue to go up and up and, and you know, the, theoretically they shouldn't be able to go up forever, but where, you know, people haven't really projected when they're going to plateau yet. <laughs> The other thing you hear a lot about is the amount of water that it takes to produce beef. So we have three types of water that we classify. Blue water is the rain, is the water that we bring out of irrigation or out of our wells. Green water is the rainfall that takes place and gray water would be for removing waste products. So for washing out the barns or, or those kinds of uh, runoffs that come off of the feedlots, those would be considered gray water. So that represents the total water footprint of the production of an animal. So we just did another work with the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. We just published this, I think it was last year, uh, where again we did another assessment of the environmental sustainability uh, going back from 2014. Again, looking at a systems approach, in this case though we also considered right through to the retail and consumption side of things. Our previous one was just at the farm gate, so we're only looking at emissions associated with the farm, not with emissions right through to uh, the time that the consumer uh, consumes the product. And we see similar reductions, again, another reduction in 15% in, in, in emissions as well, and a reduction in water consumption as well. One of the reasons why those initial water consumption estimates were so high is that the people who were doing the calculations of which we made efforts to correct within the FAO, uh, when we developed, uh, I was involved in a panel to estimate the water footprint from livestock and the original calculations were based on looking at that blue, green and grey water and so if you had one cow in a quarter section of land out grazing and a rainstorm went over, then all of that water was assigned to that cow because that land was being used to produce that animal. And so then you can imagine how uh, inflated that estimate of the water requirement would be for that individual animal. And that's what led to those exceedingly high uh, increases in estimate. We argued and, and, and to, our, to success to say that the amount of water you should assign to that animal would, should be associated with the amount of water that was used to produce the feed that she consumes, not all of the feed that's in the entire field because she's not eating all that feed. So that's, that's how it's calculated now and it dropped those estimates by about 75%. There's also a lot of work going on in, in, in looking at methods of lowering methane emissions. So we've been working at that for probably close to 40 years now. There's, in some cases, you know, there's a lot of effort that's gone on, but the rumen is an incredibly complex ecosystem. And making inroads in terms of lowering methane has shown to me a, a real big challenge. Now there's one product here called 3-nitroxypropanol or 3-NOP. It is an additive that will reduce methane emissions by about 30 to 50 percent from the animals, it, but primarily in, in feedlots or in confined systems like dairies because the product has to be administered in the feed. So it's really not suitable for administering to animals that are out grazing. And if you remember the graph I put up, most of the emissions are coming from the cattle that are out grazing, not the ones that are in the feedlot. So that product is now approved for use in Canada. Uh, Elanco is the company that's probably going to be marketing that here. And uh, at this point, they're scaling up to produce enough to meet the global uh, demand for that product and its implementations in feedlots. 
One of the uh, challenges with that product though is going to be whether it has an improvement in feed efficiency or some sort of beneficial uh, impact on growth production because right now the producers are not paid to lower methane emissions. There's no economic incentive to do that. There's only an economic incentive if that product lowers methane emissions at the same time as it improves feed efficiency. In that case then it will be a value for the producers to use it. If it doesn't do that then there's going to have to be some sort of economic incentive like carbon carbon offsets or some sort of payment to the producer in order to be able to use that product uh, to encourage them to use it. And then there's a whole bunch of other products that are being looked at, none that are as efficacy, if have the same efficacy. There is work going on as well, um, there's a group I'm involved with that's looking at trying to move that product into a bolus. Uh, so that it could be then administered to the animal and then the animal could be turned out in pasture and then it would be applicable to animals that are out grazing as well. So when we talk about water use in beef production, the other thing that uh, point I want to make is that when we talk about here, obviously uh, the blue water is really important for southern Alberta because that represents all of our irrigation system. And we know that a big reason why we have the intensive feedlot industry here in southern Alberta is because of the irrigation and our ability to predictably produce forage every year under our irrigation systems and using corn silage which has a higher yield than barley silage. So uh, those are all reasons why we, we, we have the feedlots down here. Uh, but one of the things we always have to consider that when we look at that total water use, about 95% or more of that water is used in the crop production, not directly consumed by the animal itself. So it wouldn't matter whether we're producing corn to feed cows or corn to feed people, the amount of water that would be required to produce that corn would be the same. So moving livestock out of the picture is not going to lower water use because the majority of that water is used to produce crops and unless we let that land go vacant we're going to be producing crops for some other purpose if we're not producing them for livestock. So that's an important thing to, make, to, to think and keep in mind as well. The actual amount of water that's used by the animal itself is a very small percentage of the total water that's used. The other thing we hear a lot about is carbon sequestration and capture and we've heard all that the oil sands have been you know we've heard many announcements of billion dollar projects that are going to be done up at Fort McMurray to capture all the carbon dioxide. And I just wanted to put that in some perspective as to what that would represent. So when we look at the total amount of carbon that's captured using those technologies today globally, it's about 163 million tons throughout the entire world. But we're producing about 37,000 million tons of CO2 annually. So that really represents a drop in the lake that we're capturing with those systems. By far the majority of capture that takes place, about 50% of the carbon we produced is produced by the natural process of photosynthesis. And so at this point in time, that's by far the cheapest way to capture carbon. Any of the chemical approaches or pumping it underground or all those things, even for the oil industry now, are not economically viable. Uh, many of those original projects, they've since blown them up, literally blown them up and, and uh, taken them apart because they couldn't economically afford to sustain those within their uh, oil extraction and production systems. So at this point in time, there's going to be needs to be some major changes technologically if those are really going to have any significant impact on the carbon that we're emitting. And when you talk about, you'll see also some of the ones where we're just delib deliberately drawing carbon dioxide just out of the atmosphere directly, not capturing it when, when it, the coal is being burned, where the car concentrations of carbon dioxide are much higher at the point of emissions than they are in the broader atmosphere. Those techniques where we're just bringing free carbon dioxide out of the air, those are the most expensive methods with the least amount of carbon captured. So right now, nine, you know, about 99.9% .9 of the carbon that's captured totally is through photosynthesis, a natural process, and, and one that's by far the most economical in terms of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So when we talk about greenhouse gases, you know, we can think about the cow, which is a component of that, but we really need to think about the whole system and even the broader environment. I know that fires, uh, forest fires and natural ecosystems are not considered to be anthropogenic practices, but from a greenhouse gas perspective, that really doesn't matter. That carbon dioxide still e contributes equally to global warming. 
So we need to think about the fertilizer rates and that's where livestock can play a role because we can lower, lower the amount of chemical fertilizer that's needed by using livestock manure as a fertilizer source. It also has some advantages in that it's often slower release and will stay in the soil longer than what chemical fertilizer will as well. Uh, we need to think about then how can we capture that carbon through managements of the farm, whether it be the grasslands or the croplands, or through the establishment of shelter belts or civil culture where we have combination of, of livestock production with forestry production at the same time. And then managing the manure is another part of it. How we handle that manure will have an impact on the type of greenhouse gases that are released, whether it be methane, nitrous oxide, or carbon dioxide, as well as how quickly those gases are released. Uh, depending upon how we apply it or incorporate it into the land, or whether we have secondary treatments like biogas uh, production, biodigestion, or composting. <laughs> so when it comes to North America, one of the major areas of where we had a carbon sink was in our North American grasslands. And we, you know, when we talk about destruction of and release of carbon, usually they're uh, referring to the first place that comes up is the destruction of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, uh, of, of the uh, forest and, and that of, of the Amazon in, in, in the uh, areas that they have there and through deforestation uh, of those environments. Whereas in fact the degree of threat is much greater in the grasslands. We've destroyed many more grasslands than we have the tropical forests in comparison on a percentage reduction basis. And so we, you know, we have a high degree of responsibility for that amount of carbon emission as well because breaking up those grasslands releases tremendous amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. And that conversion continues. So, you know, we we're spending a lot of money thinking about how can we develop these complex systems to capture carbon and put it in the ground. At the same time, we're, we're working up our grasslands and releasing carbon and preventing them from being significant carbon storage areas in the future. And, you know, there's got to be a balance there. The other, the other is that it, it has a, an impact on, on uh, fragmentation of the land and that breaks uh, many of the uh, corridors that a lot of wild species use as well to move amongst different geographical regions. And right now we have a corridor that runs along the eastern slopes of the Rockies, down across the bottom of the province and then back, back up along the Saskatchewan border. And if we, we did some modeling where if you convert that grassland to uh, farmland, the impact that that's going to have on the ability of wild species to move within those corridors, the implications that that could have on genetic change amongst those populations, maintaining that uh, diversity in those populations that they probably need in order to adapt to the upcoming challenges that are associated with climate change. So some of our practices are not only going to have impacts on the amount of carbon, but also on the potential ability of biodiversity to adapt to these changing ecosystems that we're seeing as a result of the temperatures and that that we're encountering. <laughs> so as soon as we cultivate up that land, we cause a loss of carbon. And that's partly because we, we uh, alter the growth of the plant, obviously, and a lot of that carbon is stored in the ground and the root systems. But at the same time, then, uh, we also are stimulating that microbial population that resides in that soil. And as they become more active, they start to utilize substrates. And those substrates contain, contain carbon. And the end product of that utilization is carbon dioxide. So that's why we lose that carbon. And so that plants that, you know, many of the plants that we plant naturally as our cultivated crops don't have near the root system that the natural native plants had that were within the grassland ecosystems. So we automatically lose some of the carbon we can sequester in the soil by the nature of the crops that we're growing and the monoculture nature of the crops that we, we have because so, they don't have the same depth of root systems that many of the natural plants had. And so that's why it's important to maintain those native grasslands. And then when you look at the balance, then really it's a, it's a balance between the amount of carbon that's input into that, so wh whether it be an application of manure or the amount of carbon that's captured through photosynthesis that has the opportunity to enter the soil versus that rate of decay. So cultivating increases the rate of decay. If we move to something like zero tillage, we can reduce that rate of decay, and a lot of that carbon input is going to be associated with the surface uh, of the soil, not so much the depth of the soil, because we're not changing the root structure or the depth of penetration of those roots into the ground. And then, of course, ultimately, we're growing all these crops to harvest, so we're harvesting that carbon off, whether it be in the form of straw, grain, or silage as well. So that represents removal of carbon from the system as well. So if that balance input is uh, greater than decay, then we'll see accumulation of carbon in the soil. If decay is greater than input, we'll see a loss of carbon. 
from that system. And that's all being driven by microbiomes. So we're, we're really getting the appreciation for the importance of these microbial communities. Uh, the people who studied it in the room and probably appreciated that amongst uh, the earliest of people that were studying microbiology. Uh, we were talking about biofilms and community consortia long before you heard anything about the uh, microbiome that we have in our own intestinal tract. Um, but those microbiomes also play a role in soil, so you're he increasingly hearing about the importance of that microbiome in soil health. Uh, which involves interactions between the microorganisms and the plant. In some cases, the plant is producing substrates for the microorganisms to utilize. In some cases, the microorganisms are producing substrates for the plant to utilize. So that synergistic interaction, and when we introduce uh, uh, system shocks that uh, break or destabilize those systems, that's when we get changes. So cultivation would be an example of one of those practices that would disrupt that soil microbiome. There's feed additives or, you know, when we feed uh, cattle grain diets, if we don't handle that properly, that represents another thing that could disrupt that microbiome inside the rumen because the cattle evolved to utilize forage. They didn't evolve originally to utilize grain, which has high levels of starch. So we have to manage that properly to avoid the microbiome from being disrupted to the point that there's negative consequences for the animal. And it's the same with our own microbiome as well. We have to treat it properly as well. Now within the soil there's different types of carbon, so the carbon at the surface is the most mobile carbon. So it tends to be broken down more rapidly. As you move down in the profile then, you get down into the stable carbon. So when we talk about wanting to increase carbon levels or carbon sequestration in the soil, we're really talking about wanting to increase that stable carbon which will persist for potentially thousands of years. So things like humic acids that tends to be phenolic compounds that are not easily broken down by the microbial population. Sugars and, and, and and even plant cell wall material is more readily degradable by those microbes and so that's more mobile carbon that'll be released back into the atmosphere in a relatively short period of time. So it's not easy to increase the amount of carbon in that lower level. The system itself will go to a natural state of equilibrium, so in a grassland ecosystem where it hasn't been disturbed by anything other than grazing, then you will start to get an accumulation and eventually that carbon level will plateau and then only if we disrupt it by doing something like cultivation will we see that carbon level change any significant amount. And then that flow of carbon has a direct impact on biodiversity. It's really what we're talking about is the movement of carbon amongst individual uh, organisms within that ecosystem, whether they be large things like pronghorn antelope or things like soil mites down in the soil. And when you start to look at this, you see how it's all interrelated and connected. And, and so disturbance in any one area has negative impacts for other areas. Uh, it's just a matter of how significant are those impacts and how long does it take for them to take place. <laughs> So this is just an example, so that it's a point I just made when you've got a long-term pasture, that carbon tends to move towards a stable uh, level. If we introduce a disruption like cultivation or even <coughs> fire, then we can have a carbon loss. And then if we reestablish it, really the beneficial carbon that we're seeing there is trying to get back to that original level. So if we plant it back to forages, that'll help us get closer to that original grassland ecosystem that was in a steady state. Uh, but if we use a, a wheat forage rotation, that gets a little bit closer because there's more carbon going in because of the forage. But if we add manure, that's more organic matter or carbon we can add for the system. Or if we just continuously crop it, we won't capture very much more carbon at, at all. And that's the same with zero tillage, like zero tillage is not going to accumulate carbon in the soil forever. It'll go up to a certain level and then it's going to plateau. <clears throat> it also depends on the nature of the diet when you start to go back to the system. So this is work that uh, was done by folks at the, at the Leopards Research Center where they had two different forms of grazing, light con continuous grazing and heavy continuous grazing. So the light continuous grazing was beneficial for the forages because they weren't under as much pressure so then they ended up sequestering more carbon into the soil because the root development was probably more intensive because it wasn't being grazed as intensively by the animals. But then if you look at the heavy continuous grazing, so that had a negative impact on the amount of soil that we sequestered, but it had a positive impact on that it resulted in lower methane emissions. So the emissions from the animal is a function of the quality of the diet. And if we continuously graze uh, under a heavy condition, we can maintain those plants in more of a vegetative state, so they're not meeting the form mature state where they go into senescence, and they're more dignified, so they have a lower digestibility. That results in less methane. 
So all these things are interacting together in terms of improving the quality of these grassland ecosystems. And cattle play a really significant role in that, basically replacing the role that the bison played prior to European occupation. And those biodiversities can change and the impact on water can be different as well. And that amount of carbon that's sequestered differs depending upon where you're talking about within those pastures. There's more carbon sequestered in the wetlands than there is up in the uplands because of that. And then finally, where do livestock fit? We need to think about the systems that I talked about where they have a role in terms of manure producing highly valuable uh, fertilizer. They utilize a lot of byproduct feeds. So for example, uh, the canola crushing industry would not exist without livestock because canola meal has a value as feed. The business models, whether you're talking about the ethanol industry or the canola industry, they don't work if the byproducts don't have any value and they become a liability and you know they would have to dispose of those in the landfills. The other point is that the, the linkage that's often forgot is even between crops like wheat or barley. You know, most, many of the producers plant wheat because they want to sell it for flour and for bread, right? You get paid more money for that. Same with barley, many pr plant it with the idea of it making malt and being used in brewing. But often, a large percentage of those crops don't meet the quality grades for those human consumption purposes. At that point, they only have value as feed. And if there wasn't a livestock industry to create that value, then that, those industries wouldn't exist either because in a bad year, they'd go bankrupt because they wouldn't be able to sell anything that's coming from their place in terms of production. So we really need this integrated system of both cropping and livestock and how they can synergistically work together in order to successfully produce food. So that's kind of what I had. Um, Kim and I, we did a, a podcast called Cows on the Planet. It's still available, I just checked it out this morning. We've had the project been done for close to a year now. But there's 36 podcasts that you can just Google and they'll come up where we covered all 36 you know, major issues associated with beef cattle production, including things like we, had a, a, we interviewed a scientist from the Amazon who was working directly with the producers there and trying to deal with the deforestation that's taking place there. Uh, we also talked about, you may have heard about lab-grown meat. We uh, interviewed an expert that's working on that in, in, on, in Ontario and Ottawa, at the University of Ottawa. And, and I, my comment was that this looks pretty damn hard to me. And he says, it is damn hard. Like, you know, I said, how quickly is this going to happen? You know, the guy, I think the guy was about 40 years old. He told me, not in my lifetime, is what he said. So, yeah, so, you know, we need, we need to, there's many of us that are interested in trying to, like, sort of sift out this kind of, there's a lot of hype around a lot of these things, like the lab-grown meat. Part of the reason for that is because there's a huge amount of investor capital going into that, right? And so if you walk in and say, well, when are you going to have this up and going? Well, it might be 50 to 60 years. You're not going to get a lot of people writing checks, you know, when it's going to take 50 to 60 years to see a return on their investments. So things to keep in mind. Thanks a lot. A thank yous to the LSCO for the uh, for their providing this room free of charge, uh, and thank you for patronizing their lunch counter. Thank you to the University of Lethbridge for their ongoing support. Thank you to the Lethbridge Herald and other media for their coverage and support. And a special thank you to Rogers TV for recording our sessions, which are available on TV and SACPA.ca archives. Next week's speaker is Tom Moffat concerning electric vehicles. For those of you who are wishing to ask questions, please line up against the wall on my left side. Um, uh, we would ask that there's no long pre preludes. We ask you to state your name uh, and, of course, uh, respectful dialogue. Um, if you, anybody has a question that they don't want to come up and ask and would like me to read it for them, please do so. I'll be happy. I'll be happy to do that. All right. When speaking into our new fancy system, please get real close to this red cap that's on the, on the microphone. It will help immensely. Thank you. Hi, Tim. Hey, Andy. <coughs> I'm Henning Lundell. And my question relates to the, are you there? Are you there? Am I there? You're there. Right there. Okay, very good. Uh, the the uh, objective of either keeping or reducing um, 
carbon emissions to help control further anthropogenic <coughs> climate change in southern Alberta in terms of number and methods of cattle production vis-a-vis -vis forage, acreage, and uh, crop production to support that. Are we in an equilibrium now? Sure, thanks, Henny. Um, actually, our, our, our beef herd is decreasing yet. So we've got, uh, I'm not sure how far it goes, this number of years, at least I think 10 years or so, maybe back to like about 1987, we're back to the cow numbers we had around that time. Uh, so it, there's a, a quite a big concern, and a lot of it has to do with demographics and farm succession. And uh, young people, you know, a lot of the cow-calf people have another job. So they work their day job, and then they come home and they work at night with the cows. And a lot of young people don't want to do that anymore. So we're seeing a reduction in the number of people within the cow-calf sector. Those that are being retained are getting larger, uh, but they're not replacing the rate of reduction. And, you know, I'm surprised that uh, the, the price of beef has obviously gone up, but the demand is, is being sustained. One would have predicted probably that given the price of beef, we'd see quite a dramatic reduction in overall demand, but that really hasn't come to be in. The calf prices now are higher highs they've ever been, and so are the finishing prices. They're selling animals out of feedlots for $4,000 each, so they've never been that high. So it's still being sustained. Part of that's probably related to the increased demand we're seeing in some of the developing countries like China. Uh, as, as countries get richer and people have more disposable income, they tend to eat more beef. So that's probably contributing to some of that sustenance of the price as well. But right now our beef herds are going down. So the number one thing that will impact your overall emissions is the size of the population. So if the population's going down, your emissions are going to be going down as well in terms of total greenhouse gas emissions. Hey, Tim. Thanks. Good to see you again. Uh, uh, Jim Byrne from University of Lethbridge, retired climate change scientist. Um, we're lucky to have Tim McAllister working on this stuff in southern Alberta. He does a great job. Great presentation. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, but but you, and, you and I, I think five years ago, you and I had a couple of beer together and with, with, along with uh, Paul Hasendonk from yeah. Chemistry and talked about the nutrient challenges, and you acknowledged them in your presentation. Um, maybe we should have another beer because, you know, NASA just, NASA just put together a study recently, you may have seen it, 2024, 50 years of harmful algal blooms. And, and it, uh, you and I both know it's not all cattle. There's lots of other sources for, for those nutrients. But I think, you know, those nutrients from cattle, I still think how, could be a huge economic benefit to the industry in southern Alberta. Could you comment on that, maybe where that's at and, and how we might, besides having another beer, how we might get that going better, okay? Sure, yeah. Sure. <laughs> And I'm up for the beer. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good, good point, Jim. Like, I, I kind of made the point about the value of uh, livestock manure as a fertilizer and how that can offset chemical fertilizer utilization. We are seeing some biodigestion go in. As well. There's another plant that's gone in with High River, but at the same time, the uh, plant that, that was up north by Lloyd Minister there, they, they haven't been operational. And they were built back when uh, Klein was, was uh, premier. So, so right now, the economics of it, in terms of what you get paid for the methane you produce, is difficult you know, without any subsidization to justify that with the investment, the capital investment it takes to build these biodigesters. But you know, when I was traveling in, in Africa, and that, that's one thing that I immediately noticed is the attitude towards manure there versus what we have an attitude towards it here in, in North America. We very much see it as a waste product, something we've got to get rid of somehow, hopefully in an in a environmentally acceptable manner, which doesn't occur all the time. Uh, but there they saw it as another revenue stream. So they were selling their manure to their neighbors and, and you know, it was much more seen as a valued product than what we see it as here. I think some of that's changing, uh, but it also gets more complicated too when you're dealing with, you know, 40,000 head of animals in a feedlot and the amount of manure and intensification of nutrients that are being uh, concentrated within that relatively small geographical area. You know, there, there is, uh, NRCB does have very tight regulations now in terms of what it takes to build a feedlot, the land base you need to have it, the slopes, the catch basin, all of that is regulated to try to reduce the likelihood of problems occurring in the future. And I think that uh, 
accomplishes something to some extent, but it doesn't get over the fact that those nutrients are still accumulated as we bring grain across Western Canada into those feedlots. You know, and all that grain has nitrogen and phosphorus in it, and it's being concentrated in the manure in, in those areas. And I think it's something we need to look at. at dispersion, there's lots of areas. The problem is the distance to transport the manure. So within 100 kilometers of those feedlots, you could find soils that are deficient in those nutrients that are required in that manure as well. It's just not economical to transport it that far. So I think composting is another one as well, but we haven't, you know, composting has been relatively steady. It's not like it's expanded either. Uh, again, marketing that can be challenging too. Like you can produce a lot of compost in a 40,000 head feedlot that'll easily meet all the garden requirements in Lethbridge, you know, in a month or two. So uh, that's another challenge they face. Hey Tim, thank you so much. And thank you for your research over your lifetime that has brought us all this uh, um, interesting and, and really relevant uh, information. So thank you for that. Um, I have two questions and it's related to the grasslands and the Amazon. Is McDonald's ruining the Amazon de through deforestation for cattle pastures for Big Macs? Number one. Number two, do you think we should return the prairies to the buffalo in order to uh, replenish our grasslands. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, just, just with regard to the research, like my, my career, I've, I've really enjoyed it, but it's really, you know, our success reflects all the people that have been involved in the program. Catherine is here, like she was a huge contributor until she decided to go be a nurse, but, but uh, yeah, and I've had I, I just countless people that have been involved that have made huge contributions and have made it really fun and rewarding to, to work in these areas. So with regard to your questions, I mentioned that we, on the Cosmic Planet, we, we we interviewed one of the leading scientists in Brazil that's working on the Amazon. And, uh, you know, that was with the previous Bolsonaro, right, who was very unfavorable towards the Amazon, partly because they didn't implement any of the regulations that are in place to try to prevent the forest from being deforested. Now that Lilu's got back in, it's getting better again in Brazil. But of course, as we know, uh, priorities change with changes in political parties, right? And that's what's happened in Brazil. So when we originally talked to them, uh, he outlined what really is causing the deforestation of, of the Amazon. And what it is is you've got a lot of very poor people there that are trying to feed their families. Uh, and, and they don't really have the money to do it. So one way they get that money is they go in into the forest and they harvest the most valuable trees illegally. And they sell them and that's how they maintain their families. Once they've done that, then, you know, the quality of the forest is reduced to some extent. Uh, so then uh, other people come in and you can still homestead there by occupying the land and turning it into agriculture. So then they'll bring cattle in at that point, which will cause further deforestation. And they'll keep those cattle there until they gain ownership of the land. Then they'll remove the rest of the forest, and then they'll remove the cattle, and then they'll plant it the soybean. So it's not one portion of that sector that's leading to the deforestation, it's all of those factors together, which start with the very poor people that are just trying to feed their family to, to sustain them. So, McDonald's is, you know, that demand for beef affects the production globally, but uh, I don't think it has to be focused. Even in Brazil, there's lots of opportunity for expansion of beef herds outside of chopping down the rainforest. So I think the cattle are sort of like a secondary component to gain ownership of that land. The land is not being used primarily just to produce beef. They've got other regions where they could produce the beef more economically, but not gain the land like they do in that conversion. What was your second question? Buffalo. The buffalo. Berries? Yeah, so I, I, I actually gave a presentation to, that to the Canadian buffalo meeting here a couple of years back, which was a really interesting thing to study as well. Buffalo have a lot of the same characteristics as cattle. Um, and, you know, should we return it back? There are some characteristics. So the, the main things that are different between buffalo and cattle and, and how it impacts the biodiversity that I talked about, like because the, they're seen as keystone species in those grassland ecosystems, buffalo are a keystone species. If we take the buffalo out and put cattle in, then cattle are the keystone species. About the only difference is, is the number of wallows. So buffalo will make a lot more of those wallows than what cattle will. And those wallows will capture water and, and create uh, areas for aquatic life 
during the springtime, which we don't get as much of that with cattle. So that's a difference in biodiversity of the insects and the amphibians and that that may exist within, within those buffalo wallows. The other difference is, is in their coat. So they have that big furry upper part around their shoulders and that. The hairs differ between cattle and between buffalo. And the insulative capacity of that type of hair, when birds use it to build their nests, is better than what they can get from cattle. And so there could be a higher survival of chicks within that situation because they're getting more insulation. Same with rodent species as well. It can have a beneficial. Other than that, in terms of how they graze and how they eat, it is very similar. Of course, what we've done, though, is we've put in fences, we've put in roadways. Some of those breakdowns and connectivity that I talked about that didn't exist when the buffalo naturally moved across the land. Uh, so when buffalo would come in, they would extensively and intensively graze the area that they were grazing in, but then they would move on and then there would be a chance for that area to recover maybe over a couple of years before they would come and return and graze that a second time. Whereas with cattle, we've fenced them into a defined area and they're going to graze that every year, right? Now we can adjust that with stocking density and proper uh, grazing management involves making sure that the number of animals matches the availability of forages, which means you need to change that stocking density over time, either by, in some cases, a dry years, moving the animals out to some other land or reducing the size of the herd. And uh, most producers recognize that, but not all producers. Uh, in my driving around the country, who would I say is the group of individuals that are uh, at greatest uh, fault of improper grazing practices? Who do you think it is? It's all of the acreages. Drive by those acreages and look at it. It's mowed down to like a golf green in almost all cases, you know, they, they're, so because they've got limited amount of land, they've got a lot of pet llamas or whatever they might be uh, that they don't have enough grazing land for, so they just, or horses, they just graze it right down to the dirt. So that's where I've seen the most overgrazing in my travels around the country. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ian Hurdle. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One, could the manure be used in a biogas facility to generate electricity? And two, you've had changed the feeding methods, and has it made any difference to the pathogenic E. coli 157? Okay, so can, can the manure be used in a biodigest? The answer is that is yes, it can be. Um, the best place to go and, and see that in action is in Germany. Um, so, you know, I talked about how we can influence the amount of methane based on the quality of the diet that we provide to the animal. It's the same with the biodigester. The amount of methane that will be yielded from the biodigester depends on the quality of what you're feeding the biodigester. So if you put manure into a biodigester, yes, you'll get methane, but you've got to think again, like, what is that manure? That's the material that was not digested by the bacteria that were naturally in the rumen to begin with, right? So it's going to have a low digestibility. That's why it wasn't digested. So you throw that into a biodigester, it's not going to be any more digestible in a biodigester than it was in the animal. The difference is, is that the retention time is much longer in a biodigester, so over time it'll eventually break down, but it'll take a longer time, quite a long time, and the methane yield will be lower. If you go out and you chop fresh corn silage and you put that into your biodigester, you'll get a much higher methane yield. And that's what happened in Germany. So they were chopping corn silage and they were making more money because of the incentives that were there to put it in a biodigester than they were feeding it to their cows. So there's some dairies in Germany that stopped doing milking and just did biodigestion because they could make more money. Now, if those subsidies go away, then suddenly that doesn't look as favorable. But that's what happened, and, and then their management of silage was horrendous compared to what we know of managing it for feeding livestock. And so they were losing a lot of energy that way as well. And then you had a, did you have another question? Pathogenic E. coli. Yeah, E. coli 157 continues to be an issue. Uh, we held the World Conference on VTech in, in uh, Banff in 2023. We were originally supposed to have it in 2021, but COVID caused us a massive amount of headache, and so we ended up having it in 2023, where we brought the world's experts to Banff to talk about that topic. So it's very much an issue yet. You know, we found that out in 2023 when we had the outbreaks out in Calgary. Uh, um, you know, cattle do play a role in that. We can genetically test. We, we got uh, a number of isolates out of cattle over about an eight-year period and a bunch of isolates out of humans. What we found 
found that there was com commonality between those isolates, but there were some properties of the isolates that we're getting from humans that were distinct from those that we were seeing in cattle. So when an organism gets into a, an ecosystem like the digestive tract of some animal, whether it be a human or a cow, uh, it will start to evolve to the systems and selective pressures that are within that environment. And you'll see differentiation of that population over time. That's what we're seeing with 0157. So it still, it, when we trace that back though, it still says that cattle was the original reservoir of 0157. But it's continuously evolving and changing over time. Uh, now that, you know, those ones that are more human orientated, not everybody that gets E. coli 0157 gets sick. Uh, so they could be transmission going from human to humans where there's carriers of 0157 that have no clinical disease but could transfer it to people that do. And that, some of that, you know, some of that was human to human transmission that occurred in the outbreak as well in Calgary. We, we sequenced that isolate, we tried to see whether we could relate it directly back to a cattle isolate to sort of get the smoking gun, but there was no, we, we couldn't do that. And, and so there was no final conclusion as to what the original origin of that organism was that caused that outbreak in Calgary. But Stephen Friedman was the one that, you probably saw his name and he was the one that led it. I'd like to think he came to the conference in 2023 in the spring before that outbreak took place where we had the world's experts there on how to treat that disease. I'd like to think that he learned some stuff from them because he had no mortalities in that outbreak, which was exceptional. Nobody died, which was a good thing. <coughs> My name is uh, Knut Peterson. Thank you very much, Tim, for coming to speak again. Last time you were here, you actually spoke about E. coli, which is uh, probably about 12 years ago, I think. <clears throat> My uh, question relates to potatoes. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how does cattle and cows, to how, how do they like potatoes? Uh, is that a good feed for potatoes? Because last year there was probably 25,000 tons plowed under in southern Alberta. And I'm just wondering how, uh, if it would be worthwhile building storages just to keep those potatoes around for feeding cattle. And the other one uh, relates to uh, and my friends out in Chin, they have an anabolic uh, digester for, for rotten potatoes, which doesn't happen very often, so th their main feedstock is manure, which they turn into natural gas and ships around the country. Uh, could you comment on those two questions? Sure. Yeah, pot potatoes are great feed for cattle. Um, a lot of the byproducts that are coming out of whether it be called potatoes or the peelings and that are already being used in the feedlots by the McCain's and, and the commercial plants that you see when you drive to, to, to Tabor. So um, we've actually got a st paper submitted right now on that topic where we looked at substituting potatoes for barley grain and how much that lowered the carbon footprint and it lowered the carbon footprint of beef production quite significantly. Uh, we're advocating, you know, when, when we make that estimate of a carbon footprint, we include all of the carbon that goes into making the diet. So all the, there's a footprint with every piece of a component of the diet that we feed to the animal. We're arguing that in the case of byproduct feeds like that or waste feeds like that that would I either end up in a biodigester or in a landfill or some other method of disposal, that we shouldn't count that carbon footprint because the livestock are doing society a benefit by utilizing that to produce food. Uh, so if you do that and, and that assumption is, is uh, allowed, then the footprint is dramatically reduced as a result of adding potatoes to the diet. So that's, uh, and then it gets back to the same thing I I in terms of as a, the biodigester side of things. Potatoes would be a better substrate than manure if you were using those waste potatoes because they have higher levels of starch. Most of the starch is digested out by the animal, that's why we feed grain diets. So the digestibility of a barley grain in a diet will be 95% plus. Digestibility of a good quality forage will be 70%. Digestibility of a low quality forage like barley straw could be less than 50%. 
Uh, so yeah, the, so it gets back, you know, we're always talking about microbes here, and it doesn't matter whether you're talking about the soil, the animal, or our own digestive tract. In order to grow and survive, those microbes need to use substrates. In order to get those substrates, they need to produce enzymes. Uh, so how complicated is it in terms of the types of enzymes that it needs to release that substrate and convert it into a firm form that the microbes can use to produce energy and grow? And the less complicated those enzymes are to do that, then the more end products you'll get. So if you put potatoes into a biodigester versus manure and measure how much methane you get, you'll get more methane out of the potatoes than you will out of the manure. Thank you, Thank you for the presentation. My name's Al Olson. Um, found some things enlightening, but I'd like to uh, question you mentioned some additives that are, have been improved that are going in to reduce methane. Uh, has there been any uh, research done on how that impacts the, uh, the value of the food that is being ingested by people? Uh, anytime there's additives being done, we've got so many uh, bacterial resistant uh, yeah. germs out there that that'd be a concern that I'd have on something that is new. Yeah. Yeah, so with regard to that question, like we, we can't just go grab something off a shelf and throw it in a cow's diet. Um, there's a very stringent regulatory process that you have to go through in order to get something approved. Uh, so that particular additive 3NOP has gone through that regulatory process, was evaluated. Uh, Health Canada is the boss. So if Health Canada has any concerns at all, with regard to any additive, whether it be used in human or livestock or even plants, uh, then it will, they, they have the ultimate hammer where they can just say, no, that's not going anywhere, and they can stop it immediately. If Health Canada approves it, then it can go over to CFIA, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, and they'll evaluate it from the perspective of its use in livestock. And they can either approve or reject it as well. It's a very long and drawn out process. It's been accelerated a bit in the last little while and it costs a lot of money in order to get through the regulatory process. So that particular one, 3 p has gone through environmental assessments. You know, does any residues come out in the urine or the feces that could have negative impacts on methane production that might take place in a peat bog, for example. Uh, so those residues are not coming out. They're not measuring it. They've measured it in the milk and the meat. Uh, that molecule doesn't persist very long in the rumen at all, actually. And it's converted into nitrate, which is a natural nitrogen compound that's reduced to ammonia. And then that ammonia can be utilized by the bacteria that are in the rumen to synthesize amino acids and make bacterial protein. So they've characterized all those metabolic pathways to know where that ends up, to make sure that it's not posing any risk. Uh, to either the health of the animal or the health of the humans or the health of the environment. And anything that's negative in any one of those three sectors can result in that additive not gaining approval. Thank you, Dr. McAllister. A very interesting presentation. Before you leave us today, do you have any takeaway message for us uh, that you can leave us with us today? Well, I, I think... Uh, the only message, and I, and I said at the beginning of my talk, what, you know, where we've kind of directed our research program, and it's not really because, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist, right? I, I'm not like a big advocate of the beef industry, let's make it as big as possible, but I didn't like, you know, a lot of the negative information and messaging that would come that was not backed by sound scientific data. And, and so that's why we, I've moved the research and we've moved the research program in that direction. Now sometimes, you know, we find unfavorable things too. It's not like beef doesn't have the problems like I talked about the eutrophication point, point that was made. Like uh, if we had the same number of cattle that we've got in southern Alberta, if those were in southern Ontario, we'd have an absolute disaster, right? Because of the amount of rainfall, the amount of eutrophication movements into the Great Lakes and uh, it would be far broader. One of the reasons why we can sustain the populations that we can here is because of the nature of the environment. We don't get a lot of rainfall. So the mobility of those nutrients is nothing like it would be in a high rainfall area. So that makes some of the difference. That doesn't mean, though, that phosphorus is not accumulating in those soils. It is accumulating in those soils. You know, at this point, we don't have phosphorus regulations like they have in Manitoba, where they have more uh, water flow issues, right, in terms of the flooding of the Red Rivers and that that you've heard about. We don't have that, that frequent or to the same magnitude here. Uh, so, but that phosphorus is accumulating. How high can it get before it negatively affects crop growth? 
because that's going to have an impact. If yields start going down because phosphorus levels are too high, that's going to have an impact that we need to deal with, right? But until then, uh, right now, because we're not seeing the same uh, severity of eutrophication, unless you're talking uh, Henderson Lake, right, where we've got all of the fertilizer running off the golf course, um, <laughs> then, then, then we're not going to have that of a issue. So I think when you get you know, bombarded with this stuff, which is now becoming more and more frequent with social media and all of that. Try to be critical in your thinking. Try to do your homework, you know. Reach out to people who you think know what they're talking about uh, to just make sure you're coming from an informed decision. It's not, and you know, a lot of people think, well, you're trying to change my perspective on how I feel about things. Everybody has the right to feel how they want to feel about whatever topic you're talking about, right? Our objective is just to make sure you're doing it from an informed perspective. If you realize all these things, so a really good example of this would be implants. Implants, hormonal implants that we use in cattle, right? We use those routinely in our Canadian production system. All of those implants go through the same regulatory thing that I just talked about with Health Canada, CFIA, before they can be approved to be used. They are the additives that reduce feed efficiency or improve feed efficiency by more than any other additive that we have or tool that we have in our production system. They will improve feed efficiency by anywhere from 5 to 20 percent. So that means it takes 20 percent less feed to get the same amount of animal. All right, so that has a huge implication on the footprint. The carbon footprint is dramatically reduced as a result of using those additives. Now, some people will say, I don't want to eat beef that's getting hormones. Okay, that's fine. You, you have the right to make that decision, but realize that it's at the expense of increasing their carbon footprint by about 20% as well. If you're comfortable with that, then make the decision, you know. But if you want, care more about the environment, then maybe you want to eat beef that's been implanted. Okay? Thank you, Dr. McAllister, and thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you.